Ashley. Welcome to my show at show Ether Reality at the Schaefer Gallery at the Barton Community College. Um, this is a pretty large show and it has a lot of diversity to it for me. I mean, it's the largest show I've ever had in a solo show. And part of the fun here is that it's called Ether Reality is the whole show, but there are multiple shows within a show. There's little sections, um, series you could call them, um, sort of like mini shows inside of the, the, the larger show of the paintings. The paintings are kind of the focus, and um, that's in part why we're here and in part, a big part of why Dave, thankfully, invited me to have a show here. So I think we could just walk around and look at a few pieces here and there. Um, I get categorized most often in the category of, with my paintings, I'm considered a magic realist. <clears throat> Magic realism is not quite like surrealism. It's a little less flying snakes and hallucinations as it's a, well, that's possible and would be a really weird moment, but it's got some reality to it. So it's magic realism. I'm also occasionally referred to my work as, it's referred to as emotional realism because often some of the paintings in particular were focused on a, an emotion or a story as opposed to just a, uh, a scene or a, a pretty moment. So these are some of the pieces in the, that are from the, these are all oil paintings. Um, in this area, the two, there's, this is some of the freshest ones, but the two that are probably the most, mean the most to me, is this one that's called Evanescence. Um, I love it when people say, do I work from live models? And I have a, a photo of, uh, I have a, a photos that I've used. And uh, no, I didn't get a woman to lie on a bunch of great blue herons and fly through the sky. I often work with, I don't call them models, I call them muses, because that's more likely what they are. They, get, they help me come up with ideas. We, we bounce things off each other, we try things. And this is a really good example. But this has been a very popular piece. Um, I enter it and chose, and a lot of times that's the one that gets me the most notice. So that's Evanescence. That's one of the newer ones. And newer ones, this is the newest painting. This is called Idol. And Idol is a painting that was painted specifically to uh, be completed for this show. Um, perfect example of muse, not model. Um, I literally had my model who was my muse, Crystal. Crystal was lying in a koi pond and I took photos of her. Um, I make a lot of artistic choices as I go through these, but mostly those choices are not as much about technique as they are about content or story or, you know, one of my favorite quotes is a Francis Bacon quote, which is, the job of the artist is always to deepen the mystery. I love that quote. So here's this beautiful woman, all nature, everything's nice, but, she has, a fr she has a little friend, and the snake was added to deepen the mystery, to make the story more complex, to um, add some questions. Does she know? Does she not know? Is it scary? You know, all those things. So it opens the door to having uh, more than just a pretty moment, even though it's a pretty cool moment. <laughs> Over in this section, This is a series, these are actual prints of paintings. The paintings have all been sold, and they are literally scattered all over the US, and a couple of them are out of country. These are called the Humanimals series. And the Humanimals series, um, it's one of the lighter sides of some of the work that I do. Honestly, the truth is, is these are all based on friends of mine. Each one of these paintings was inspired by a friend, um, a, a photographer who wishes he was as thin as a cheetah. Um, a friend, uh, the bon vivants, the polar bear, no matter what, the woman that inspired that lives the good life. She's just, she's, she's unflappable, she's always positive, and she's always having a good life. So these are all 12 different ones that are personalities, they inspired them. The one that really started it all off, I didn't sit down and say, I think I'm gonna make a series of animals doing human-like things based on my friends. I, it was this painting here. I'd taken a photograph of a giraffe 
in a zoo sitting as opposed to standing. I, if there's a con any sort of connection between a lot of these things is I go out and explore and I, I relish the uncommon as opposed to uh, just a, a common version of beauty or a common way we see things. A cheetah running through fields is not quite the same as a cheetah taking a photograph. So here's the aesthete. The aesthete was based on a friend of mine. And Trisha's a little vain. <laughs> and I, I don't know exactly why. I, don't, I can't put my finger on it. It's kind of like writing a song. Sometimes you come and you, get a whole, you could get a whole series of the lyrics, and other times you've got to work at it. I just decided to put this, this mirror in front of the, of the giraffe. The giraffe's kind of checking her, him, her, self out. And it made me think of, of Trisha. Well, I sh showed it to Trisha. And as if I'd asked for this, she said, well, you know, if you'd have turned the mirror a little bit more this way, you'd have two of me. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, that's perfect. I mean, that just, and so that just set me off down this whole path of thinking of my friends as, friend, my friends as, a, as an animal. And here's and Trisha. And when I told her that this was about her, and then she loved that. So, because she's happy with herself. <laughs> and, and when I say vain, I, I joke, but she's, she's a, re a remarkable woman who's um, worthy of respect. Here are more paintings first. Let's look at some of these. Um, people often talk to me about where I get my ideas, where's, what's my content, what's my goal. Well. It's not as simple as words. It's kind of trite artist say, but that's why I paint, paint. But I'm really exploring different ideas, different visions, different emotions. Uh, and, and that inspiration can come from so many different places. And um, I don't really have a pattern or a system in which I get new ideas. I just, I, I am really drawn to the out of the ordinary. So I go to a lot of museums that are out of the ordinary uh, places books, movies, things like that. So these are more of the paintings in the series here at the Ithi Reality Show. Um, this piece is probably the one that, it's interesting, I get a lot of painters who look at this, and they, they look at this, it's called a whisper of echoes. This was based on photos that I took in a medical history museum, the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. And um, it's a long story, but you have to have permission to take photos in there. It was fantastic. My camera was on fire. I took so many photographs. But a lot of artists, and particularly painters, look at this and go, how in the world did you do that plastic? And this is one of those moments where I look at that and I get finished and go, well, dang, that came out pretty cool. <laughs> I had no idea. I'm a self-taught painter. Um, I was a sculptor and jeweler, metalsmith, most of my life. Um, I did 3D art. That was what I did for a very long time. And that brings us to this piece that's kind of hard to ignore piece. Um, this is the Soul Rejuvenator. And when I list all the art medias that I've worked in, though they were 3D, but there was many kinds, you know, like I said, jewelry, metalsmithing, installations, sculpture of various kinds. Well, I was invited to be in a show, and it was a big show, and it was very prestigious to be honored by being selected from the, an entire community to be one of two people representing that community in this incredible show. Anyway, at that time I was doing printmaking, I was doing photography, I was doing sculpture, I was making jewelry, and I drawing, I've always done drawing. Well, for this one I needed some color. So I ended up doing these tiny paintings. So rejuvenated. These are all symbolism. Even in my jewelry I did a lot of symbolism, different cultures. I so enjoyed the little paintings. After I put this in the show, um, fortunately sold it to a, I'm sworn to secrecy, but a world-renowned magician, and he owned it. And then I thought, I think I want to do another painting. So this piece was the piece that sent me off on a completely different path. In 2019, I made this piece. I, within three, four months, I did a couple more paintings. They came out better than I expected. And I totally shifted from, paint, from all my 3D stuff to painting. And this is the Soul Rejuvenator. It's a kind of a quackery thing, kind of a carnival thing. Uh, it's just a curious object. It's made out of a 
how appropriate now that I'm in Kansas, of a corn shelling machine. And again, all the paintings have some symbolic meaning about rebirth and life and life after death and all those kinds of things. So this is interesting moment for me is the soul rejuvenator was created and displayed before I was a painter. So this is now borrowed for this exhibit and it's in the presence of the paintings and it was never in the presence of the paintings. So one of the biggest treats for me in this ex exhibit is I'm showing a lot of work that's never been in the presence of itself. Um, I've only had a, one other show where I had paintings in my photography in a show. I would either have a painting show or a photography show. But to have this here and some other sculptural pieces in the presence of the paintings is just like, wow. I just, it's, really, it's really energizing and inspiring for me. It's kind of, even I'm scratching my head going, I made all this stuff? Jeez, what was it? Focus, people, focus. Well, I did once I got into painting. This is a good example of where we're stepping into where the, the paintings and photographs are in the same space. Um, there's actually more photographs in here than, than, than paintings. And yet, in ways it can seem very disparate. I have photography and you got the painting, you got the Medusa over here, and we got over here. But again, the thing that they have in common is my fascination with the human condition. Um, I, I, I like emotions. I like to seek beauty where you least expect it as opposed to where you would traditionally expect it. And I do that in both the paintings and the photography. Um, using the, the photos as a really obvious example of this, I went to a place, among many others, called the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in Western Pennsylvania. It's an 800-room former lunatic asylum. My camera was on fire. It was unbelievable. And the goal was, as I hoped, I achieved and found sites and places that were beautiful and disturbing all rolled together. It's like, oh, look at that. And it's just, wow, look at the light coming in there. And then you go, wait a minute, someone used to live here. That juxtaposition. It's not that sunsets aren't beautiful, but I would be hard pressed to ever be in an environment like that again with a camera taking photographs. And I'm taking the photographs, honestly, for my own amusement. I'm, I'm capturing a vision, an emotion, a confusion, whatever it is. That's feeding me. That's inspiring me. Whether I do a painting of that moment, not necessarily. I, I, I rarely do that. I usually have, when I'm doing paintings, they, they're figurative. Um, but it's that attitude, that exploration, new environment, going into a room and with your eyes closed and you can start feeling what's going on in this room and say, whoa, and open your eyes and go, look at this place. And then you th throw into the mixture that this used to be inhabited by human beings. As I mentioned with the skeleton uh, behind plastic, those were living people at one point. They're, this isn't a freak show. This isn't a Ripley's Believe It or Not. Those, they were collected and they can tr continue to contribute to society as medical examples. Same thing with these. When you see these, I take photographs often in abandoned buildings, but I've gotten quite a few in asylums, um, psychiatric care centers, jails, reform schools, just architecture, even architecture that used to be hyperactive and full of, of machines and people and all that, and now it's empty. There's a, f a feeling to that, and it, it doesn't matter what my feeling is. I'm not trying to educate anyone. I'm just exploring my own feelings. So these are all photographs from, I mean, some of them I just, it's like you can't, as they say, you can't make this up. I, I, I come around the corner and go, oh, look at that, look at that. And it's vast. And it's not on the normal tour for tourists. Let's go over to the Lunatic Asylum, or shall we go to the, you know, Disney World? I don't go to Disney World. <laughs> and if I go to Disney World, I want to see behind the scenes and underground. I don't know. That's me. So here's some more of the paintings. Um, again, I mentioned that I have, I use my models, our, our muses. Um, some of the times they're fairly literal translations. And as in these two here, obviously they're not. 
Um, I've used both of these two friends. Most of, again, most of them are artists. Um, and they've inspired three or four paintings each. And no, neither one of them had snakes or iguanas on their head when I was taking the photograph. Um, Kim here, never. she didn't even have this, this sleeve tattoo. It just came up. And it's like, one of the connections here is my fascination with other cultures also. So symbolism, religions, belief systems, mythology, whatever, I, I find that very fascinating. And for me personally, aside from being an artist, I am most drawn to and curious about what they have in common, not what they have separate. So I will often use things that are uh, obviously myth mythological, as an example here, Medusa, Ooh, big surprise. And then I added that deep in the mystery and I put butterflies into the mix. And um, that's me just messing with mythology, messing with ideas, feelings. Well, snakes are creepy, but butterflies are so pretty. That's me, I can't help myself. <laughs> that's what I do. Um, these are just a couple others. That's all unbelievable, one of the most amazing moments in my life as an artist, what came as a result of this painting in all of the lives of the three of us that were connected. This woman, the woman's mother, and myself, some stuff happened. We're talking X-Files, wow, is that cool? Um, these two are pretty literal, but it kind of shows, this is very literal from a photograph, except she had an ugly hat on, I took it off and she was happy. Um, and then she was standing in a green forest, and I decided to paint her in, a, in, an, in an aftermath of a burned forest. And that turned out to be something from her past that was just, wow, really? How did you get there? I don't know. And then this one is the same as the one with the iguana, same Ma Muse Kim, but I made her much younger on purpose. This is another one of uh, the pieces that I think of when people ask me why I make choices I make, content. Some people think she looks very pe peaceful and some people th find her as being trapped. I love that, that there is no black and white answer. And it's interesting, women in particular seem to have a very different opinions. I love that. As an artist, the biggest payback for me, which is part of why I'm so thrilled about this show, is to step back and listen to people and hope that the paintings compel them to interact with the piece. Look at it a minute. It doesn't matter if, if they get what I'm trying to say. I'm usually not trying to say anything. I'm exploring things and emotions. But I just sit like a fly in the wall and listen to people, be engaged, curious. That's the payback for me. Now this whole section is the sh one of the shows within a show. It's called Memento Vivre. And Memento Vivre the simple Latin translation is remember life or remember to live. And this is one of the things that in many cultures, um, I believe they, they, they deal with death in a very different way than we do in America. There's lots of rituals, traditions, respect, memories in a very different way than we do in America. And I find that sad. And now that I'm a much older guy, there's more and more people, that, that friends and family that I love that are passing. And it, it's just not gonna be over at a, at a memorial service. So what do we do with it? Well, as an example, on this table, um, there are multiple paintings and they're loosely based on what was called memento mori photography. Memento mori photography was post-mortem photography. They would take a photograph of their loved one after they'd already passed away. This was early in the life of photography. Um, not everyone, very few, could afford to pay, pay an artist to do a painting of their loved one. So they had nothing. They didn't have an iPhone in their pocket and it's full of a thousand photographs. They had nothing but their own memories. So they started taking memento mori. Memento mori means remember death. Um, there's many cultures that look at death, death very different than we do. And part of it is, is to, uh, realize that we're all going to die. 
so you had better do good things while you were here. <laughs> and that no matter if you're rich or poor, that's one of the common things we have. So memento mori would be how you would capture an image from um, of a relative or a loved one that you could keep with you. Sometimes there were lockets, and sometimes there were these little, these little, these little um, daguerreotype, tin-type books. And this would be something you would own. It would be you'd put it on display in your house. And this is your uncle Fred, whatever. And so you're honoring him. He's not in a box in the basement. He's being shown because that's a treasure to them. They didn't have 35 photos of Uncle Fred. Um, so sometimes they would prop them up. Sometimes they would take um, photographs just prior to death. They may be very ill, and um, the ultimate ending is soon. It's on the horizon. So um, that, that's part of what this whole memento vivre, remember life, which is a slightly different angle. That means remember to live. So not only are you going to die, live well. Do good things. So it's a slightly more positive twist to the terminology. Um, these have a lot of symbols in them that are, as I mentioned, showed you that one here. He's got a clock behind him. It's a clock behind his shoulder, symbolic of your time's about up. In Europe, oh, a lot of Dutch painters painted these paintings that were called vanitas. And a vanitas had objects in the painting that would remind you of mortality. A burning candle, a candle that's almost a uh, hourglass that's about to run out of sand, um, things you can't take with you, money, books, wealth. Um, it might have a flower that is no longer at its prime and it's dying. Those were in the painting. So I kind of combined some of those things. And Day of the Dead symbolism, Natitas from um, South America. It's another, another celebration in which they celebrate their past loved ones in, in a very active way. And in cele cele oh, there's that word, cele they celebrate their relatives instead of, oh, it's, I miss Uncle Fred. Most people don't say that out loud. So they have whole festivals based on remembering relatives. They will have a literal skull of Aunt Betty on a platter surrounded by food and flowers and whatever, and they march them through a parade. And the whole family will all gather together and, and they will tell stories and talk about their ancestors after the fact. We don't do that kind of thing in America. And these are rituals. These are, these are thousands and thousands of people do this annually. So this whole section is Memento Vivre, and it's based on that concept of remembering to live because you too will die. Your time will come. Um, as you can see some of these, you know, this is a pretty odd and mysterious thing going on here. These were called the hidden or invisible mothers. Um, the mother would have a child that was going to die, which infant death was far more common than it is today for medical reasons. And the baby wouldn't sit, had not passed, but the baby wouldn't sit still for a photograph. So they would throw fabric over the mother and the baby would sit on the mother's lap for the photographs. And then I took butterflies again, in this case actually blue moths, to symbolize that transition from life to death to life. Um, and that's what these are. And there's a funerary wreath, wreath for the show. And these are pieces I did a while back. Um, again, taking photographs in chapels, cemeteries, a uh, variety of different um, monuments, and that's what these are based on. I did a whole series a while back of inanimate objects coming to life, and that's why these are all these individuals that were um, monuments and cemeteries. I also did them with dolls, puppets. Um, they were all part of the series. <clears throat> it's it's a, an attempt to kind of show some of the places I just mentioned mentioned that one there, St. Saint, Saint Lucia. This was in St. Rock's Cemetery in New Orleans. And um, that going in there and taking photographs inspired this painting. So sometimes the photo sessions go down that. That's the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Imagine going through room to room to room. It's amazing. And so this, is whole, this whole presentation here is just kind of taking people a little bit of a journey that I go through when I'm 
exploring life, exploring potential paintings and, and, or, or art pieces, and how one thing leads to another, leads to another. And on the walls here are some photographs. Again, these have never been in the presence of the paintings. This was prior to the painting's existence. And this is a show called Candle Power. All the photographs were taken um, in candlelight only. Um, with a very low resolution early, because I'm so old, early digital camera. It had 1.8 megapixels or something like that. It's like, really? How crazy is that? And um, the show itself was, when it was shown the first time, it was lit by candles as opposed to gallery lighting. But it, again, it shows some connection between my symbology, um, ritual, exploring different rituals, uh, beauty of the human body, but not necessarily in that traditional Hollywood version, but in different body shapes, different body positions, not selfies, not posed fashion shots, but more ritualistic, um, curious visions. And in this case, I had multiple artists be my muse, and they participated. Oh, let's try this, and this built this pile of candles in an attic, in an attic in a, in a cellar of a, of a building in Pueblo, Colorado. And this is what came out of it. So you can see throughout this show, hopefully you can see some of the connections in the different medias, but in the content or the spirit, attitude, whatever you want to call it. And again, to kind of sum it up in some ways is that this Ether Reality show is such an a, a, a honor for me to show, and me having these pieces in the presence of each other reminds me, again, of why I make art. I, I'm not a guy who makes art for eye candy to, to, to decorate with. Uh, I want to explore emotions, mine, others, whatever, and I want people to look, if I'm lucky, feel. Maybe they can engage in, a, in an image that will touch them, touch their mind, stories, heart. Sometimes it may even touch your soul. That's the ultimate payback. It's nice to sell work, but if I'm painting, to, painting art, making art to sell, this is a bad choice. <laughs> this is more, my, my barometer of success is interacting, having the art interact with people. And again, this show at the Schaefer is I've never had the breadth of work uh, as this. And thank you for coming.